गुड इवनिंग सर अ वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल द फैकल्टी मेंबर्स एंड टू ऑल द स्पीकर्स एंड ऑल द पार्टिसिपेंट्स सो वी आर ऑल सेट फॉर द इवनिंग एंड आई वुड लाइक टू स्टार्ट दिस सेशन बाय अ वेरी फेमस सेइंग ऑफ आइंस्टाइन दैट इज इंटेलेक्चुअल ग्रोथ शुड कमेंस एट बर्थ एंड इज ओनली एट द डेथ टुडे आई वुड लाइक टू वेलकम आवर वेरी एस्टीम्ड गेस्ट स्पीकर्स वेलकम सर वेलकम मैम एंड आवर फैकल्टी मॉडरेटर द शिव सर now over to you sir so that you can welcome our guest speakers thank you very much a very good morning evening good afternoon depending on from where you all are joining on behalf of iihmr university i extend this formal welcome to our esteemed panelists dr bhartend rai and dr monica wahiji and i also welcome all the participants participating from different parts of world uh this session is especially significant because uh, first thing we are touching such an important uh, theme that is ai applications in healthcare and second that we have two wonderful experts with us dr bhartendu rai uh, who is also chairperson of the decision science department at uh, university of massachusetts uh, at dartmouth and uh, he has a very good experience in reliability quality along with artificial intelligence so that gives a unique combination we have miss monica wahiji who is uh, having a rich background in public health and then in technology biostatistics and this makes it, the combination wonderful thank you so much for accepting our request and joining this one second i welcome you all and now rest over to the panelist for taking the workshop forward thanks uh, dr tripathi should i start with my presentation first ji please today i'll be talking about ai for healthcare my name is uh, bharatindra rai and uh, i'm from university of uh, massachusetts dartmouth as the name suggests uh, this university is uh, basically in massachusetts as far as covid is concerned uh compared to other states i think massachusetts is doing really well it used to be like in thousands now it's like uh, in i think couple of hundreds so that's a good news so i have been with uh, this university for almost uh, 14 years now and i used to work at uh, ford motor company before this as a quality and reliability engineer and before that i was a faculty at uh, indian statistical institute in fact around 89 i was in jaipur so that's long back and uh, my father was in army at that time and he was posted in jaipur i was doing masters and i used to frequently visit uh, jaipur so very nice city i still remember so i see actually uh, right now around 107 participants so 100 plus this is very pleasant surprise because uh, just before this uh, covid things started happening i went to a conference in los angeles and as you know like uh, we make presentations about our research papers and things like that so when i went to the room where i was designated to make a presentation i saw there was only one person sitting in the room and it was big bit shocking but i have seen like it happens in big conferences when you have so many parallel sessions so i was at least happy that at least one person is there and before starting my presentation i thanked him that uh, at least uh, he showed interest and came to listen to my presentation so he said actually uh, i am the next speaker so you don't have to thank me 100 plus i think that's a very good uh, audience so i'm so happy so let's go to the agenda or the outline of my talk today so i'll start uh, with very basic things like what is ai what is machine learning data science and how they are related and uh, then i will also cover some case studies that i was involved in and some other case studies that we are working on we also look at uh, crisp dm process crisp stands for cross industry standard process for data mining so i like to start with the first part which is uh, what is ai machine learning and data science and how they are related this is a very uh, popular picture you may have seen earlier also where you have this artificial intelligence as a bigger umbrella and within that the subset of ai there is a machine learning and then there is a subset of machine learning which is a deep learning 
AI, as you know, words are artificial intelligence. So this is not a new terminology. It has been there since uh, 1950s. And intelligence basically relates to human beings, at least because uh, right now we rule the world. So we choose to decide that uh, we are intelligent. Artificial intelligence uh, specifically refers to machines. They get some kind of uh, intelligence by doing certain things. There are a lot of examples you may have come across. I will just uh, very quickly quote uh, one study that was done with Facebook because many people use Facebook. This study found that uh, if you have data on 68 Facebook likes of somebody, you can predict skin color of that person with 95% accuracy. With the same data, uh, people can also like, obviously not people, but machines, they can accurately classify somebody's sexual orientation or political affiliations with 88% accuracy. With 10 likes, you can evaluate persons better than interviewing a coworker. With 70 likes, you can outperform, machines can outperform friends who thought they knew about him or her. With 150 likes, the machines can do better than their parents. With 300 likes, the machines can uncover things that even their partners did not know. And with data on more than 300 likes, they can outperform person themselves. What I know about myself with 300 plus likes, machines can do better than that. So nowadays, like smartphones are so common and smartphones are more or less like uh, questionnaires which everybody is filling almost uh, on a constant basis. Artificial intelligence is becoming very popular, and especially like nowadays, there are some leading things that are happening. And uh, one of them is self-driving cars. So I'm sure you have heard of uh, Elon Musk's plan of having cars without steering wheels. So cars that can drive themselves. And the problem he's trying to solve is very big in a way because the cars that people buy, as per a study, we use the car only 4% of the time. 96% of the time that car is either parked somewhere or just idling. Self-driving cars obviously can solve problems of traffic jam, pollution, and things like that. Now machine learning, the word machine is basically a computer and learning happens with data. So we provide a lot of data to algorithms and those algorithms can find a way to do certain things that usually are done by humans. There are so many examples like face recognition. If you go to Facebook or Google Photos, they are able to recognize faces. Deep learning is again, a subset of machine learning where mostly people make use of deep neural networks. So neural networks with several layers in it. So this is an example about use of artificial intelligence for solving breast cancer related problems. So computer vision is used here for medical image recognition. Just like algorithms are able to recognize somebody, somebody's face. Similarly, they can recognize uh, certain images and detect whether or not there is a problem. And the algorithm that was used by Google here is deep learning. So they used uh, very deep uh, neural networks. And the accuracy that was obtained by pathologists who are specialists in dealing with these kind of images was 73%. And the AI system was able to improve it in less time to higher accuracy of almost uh, 89, 90%. Another example is regarding patient appointments. There are times when there's an appointment and then the person doesn't show up. This study was done with 22,000 MRI appointments and the AI tool was able to identify 90% of the patients who may not turn up for a given appointment. And with that, obviously, if you are able to schedule somebody else, they were able to save uh, close to $1 million per year with this one application. 
there are three major areas that we see when we look at like AI examples. One example that we just saw was AI in medical imaging. And typically it makes use of deep neural networks. And then we have like AI involvement in healthcare communication. So communication is a very important part of healthcare. And it could be written communication or audio communication, managing that data in a smart way. That's second key area in healthcare. And uh, there are also a lot of medical dosage errors that happen. And in fact, there's a big opportunity there for AI systems to help and reduce those kind of uh, errors. In fact, this study also reported that AI health market is projected to grow more than 10 times within next five years. That's obviously a lot of opportunities for people working in this field and also for like students who are trying to build a career they will also see this as a very positive thing that there will be obviously more jobs because of these changes. This is a very standard uh, definition of uh, big data that you may have seen, three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. When we are dealing with big data, there is a huge volume of data. Some examples, not from healthcare, but other places are like transactions at, let's say, Amazon. Every second, there are thousands and thousands of transactions that happen. It comes with a lot of velocity in real time. Just like if you go on Twitter, you see tweets coming from all directions. And then there's a variety. And the type of data that machine learnings use or deep learning algorithms use could be structured or unstructured. So structured data is uh, estimated to be around 5%, the typical data that we come across, let's say Excel file, nice rows and columns, that contribute uh, only about 5%, but 95% of the data is unstructured, which could be text data, like in healthcare, it could be transcriptions, it could be audio data, like uh, recordings of a doctor, it could be video, it could be images, and so on. One thing usually I also like to point out is that these AI systems or machine learning systems, they are trained to work only with the structured data. Data that are in nice rows and columns. They are not for unstructured data. But the thing is, in unstructured data, we have so much of useful information. Before this data can be used, you will find that most of the algorithms are designed in such a way that before you can use a particular method, you have to do a lot of uh, pre-processing of data. So basically some kind of preparation of the data before you can use a machine learning or deep learning algorithm. And what that extra step does is very simple that extra step basically converts unstructured data into a structured data so that we can make use of those machine learning methods or statistical methods. So even if we have a text data, so text data has to be first converted into some structure. We cannot use uh, and apply these uh, AI algorithms directly on a text data, but we have to first convert it into structure. We have to give some structure to it we are working on a paper where we are looking at transcriptions and the response there is a speciality. Feeding the transcriptions, it could be audio or text. We should be able to classify that automatically into one of the specialities. And for doing that, first thing we have to do is we have to convert that text data into some kind of numbers which are more organized and then work with that. There are a lot of big data applications all around us. Like if you look at sports, NBA is very popular in US. We have these uh, smart basketballs, which are embedded with more than 30 sensors. And when these players dribble the basketball and take it around, so all the data, all the movements, everything gets recorded. And that is analyzed to improve the game. It could be a player or the team and so on. Health is one of the big areas in AI and big data applications. 
and all the big players if you look at like apple when they came out with the apple watch health related uh, things were one of the major attractions or uh, design features of apple watch homes are smart nowadays you can switch off your lights for example or you can program your air conditioning or heating systems remotely cars are very smart if you compare like today's car with the model t ford's model t so obviously there is a huge difference in fact uh, even love is nowadays smart or intelligent there is a story about this lady who went on a date she went to a very expensive uh, restaurant uh, for dinner with a guy and once the dinner was uh, over almost over so this guy told that lady that give me a few minutes i'll be back from restroom and uh, he went and uh, did not return so this lady was very unhappy and uh, it affected her so much that she started uh, basically a new company where a male and a female are paired based on more than 25 different like metrics so that many metrics have to match before they can go on a date so this company is now called e harmony and she is the she was the founder of the company and i think she is also the ceo all this smartness or intelligence that we see in machines or computers or phones so if you look at 1960 this is a ibm's mainframe computer and there are two people two scientists operating it and it's a big room and lot of big equipments today the smartphone that we have in our hand is much more powerful than the supercomputer that we had in 1960s so that's what has made ai possible ai applications possible today so let's look at uh, first case study so this uh, case study was done by one of my phd students she graduated uh, in december last year focus of her phd was uh, healthcare analytics and this paper is about user independent detection for freezing of gait in pds or parkinson disease so as you know parkinson disease happens sometime at in old age and freezing of gait is a problem in old age so freezing of gait can cause a person to trip and fall down and after like somebody who is like 70s or 80s a fall can make things very difficult so sometimes somebody may uh, break their bones and the healing is very slow in old ages so it is a big problem but another problem is that there is no cure for this there is no medicine available that can take care of freezing of gait what can be done is like if we can predict even a fraction of a second before this freezing of gait happens and alert the patient uh, through some system that fall can be avoided so we made use of a random forest machine learning algorithm for this what we did was the data was collected like this we tied sensors to ankle upper thigh and trunk and uh, there were actually three of them the data was being collected on a horizontal acceleration vertical and horizontal lateral response was whether there was any freezing or no freezing and this was labeled by the physios after collecting the data and creating a random forest model we created this confusion matrix that we do so this is the actual class 1 and 2 these are the predicted class on the left side actual 1 and predicted 1 means actually there was no freezing in the patient and the model also predicted that there will not be any freezing of gait similarly there was 796 cases where actually freezing of gait happened and the model was able to predict so on the diagonal that we see we have correct classification and off diagonal this 44 and 13 are incorrect classifications so the idea is to minimize off diagonal items or numbers and maximize the numbers on the diagonal so if we can develop a machine learning algorithm that can do better than this so obviously that model is better so usually when we apply machine learning methods we don't uh, apply only one method we apply many methods 
and then compare them and select the one that gives best outcome. So misclassification error was about 0.45. So accuracy level was about 99.5%. So we calculate that by adding the diagonals and dividing it by the total. When you do one minus, you get 0.45%. Another application is deep learning. So this is uh, from one of my chapters in the deep learning book that I wrote uh, recently. So there are 21 independent variables in this data set. So this is more traditional data. You can classify this towards like uh, structured data. And this is a CTG data that we get. And response is N, S, or P. N is normal, S suspect, and P is pathologic. So we developed a deep learning model. And one problem that you see in this bar plot, the proportion of cases that are zero or normal are almost 80%. When we deal with big data and we try to develop artificial intelligence applications, I'm sure you hear a lot about misrepresentation of data in some ways. The algorithms sometimes get biased. So there was a popular actually deep learning algorithm which was applied to uh, pictures. And the problem was that somebody who developed that algorithm used uh, mostly data from people whose skin color is mostly white. But when new data was given to it, like uh, people with black skin color, so algorithm uh, classified them as gorillas. Obviously, the model which uh, doesn't have like balanced data or if uh, this unbalancedness is not addressed, you get very strange kind of outcome. This data is uh, highly unbalanced. You can see 80% of the cases are normal. In healthcare field, uh, this is very common that most of the times the normal data is much bigger than abnormal data. Suspect data is about 10% and uh, pathologic data is less than 5%. But the good thing is when we use these deep learning algorithms developed by Google, uh, TensorFlow and Keras, they have a mechanism to address this unbalancedness. So we did that and ran it for uh, 20 epochs. And you can see accuracy is at the top, loss is at the bottom. And the red ones are for training data and blue ones are for validation data. So we do not see very huge gap between the two. Otherwise, we have to be very careful about overfitting when we are doing deep learning. But this outcome was okay. And this is the confusion matrix. And you can see that this algorithm was able to predict normal suspect and pathologic cases with 78, 79, and 84 percent accuracy. These numbers may not look very high, like not 99 percent or over 90 percent. But what you will notice is that in spite of the normal data being 80 percent, it is not really dominating. It's not that the accuracy is the highest for only normal and too bad for pathologic cases. So in fact, uh, this outcome is very, very consistent. It has done a good job in balancing the three classes as far as like the outcome is concerned. Another example is NLP. So apart from like computer vision and audio applications, NLP is a, another big area in artificial intelligence. And uh, if you look at examples all around us, like Siri or Amazon's Alexa, it can talk to you and it can answer like very basic questions that you may have. I don't know whether they will be able to pass the Turing test that was designed in 1950s, where the machines are able to talk like human and you cannot like detect any difference between the two. I met a professor actually from a computer science department uh, at one of the conferences. I think it was IBM's conference. And he had a big class and he was assigned uh, 12 TAs, teaching assistant for his class. Because of the popularity of the class, the number of students who enrolled was uh, bigger than expected. And he asked for one more TA and his request was denied 
because of whatever reason. So college mentioned that like uh, you cannot afford like one more. You already have 12. So what he did was uh, he created a TA, which was a virtual TA, like not a real TA, but a computer program. So when a student sends an email, this algorithm will basically apply. So it was trained on all the interactions between TAs and students for past several years. So he had all those uh, data and he fed this into this uh, chatbot and he was able to create uh, artificial intelligence kind of a TA. And it just happened that uh, after the semester was over and uh, I don't remember the name of this virtual TA, but he named it after a girl. And one of the students, uh, he was trying to interact with this and asking for like going for a date with her. So I'm sure like uh, that would have passed the Turing test because even the students were not able to figure out that this was not a real person, but it was just a, a bot. So NLP actually, those of you in the audience who have plans to do PhD or you're doing PhD, this is one big area of research. There's a lot of opportunity. There is very little that has been done, but there is so much, so much of work yet to be done. So this is a very, very hot field for a lot of things. And especially in healthcare, there are a lot of opportunities for somebody working in NLP area. So the data here is a medical speech. So it's audio data. And the response is basically, it gets converted into common symptoms. And you may know that uh, when we work with text data, because this speech will be converted into text, from text to numbers, uh, giving it some kind of structure uh, before we apply deep learning methods. So one of the popular methods or models that we use in deep learning is LSTM, long short term memory. And basically it doesn't look at each word as it is, but also tries to retain linkage between the previous words and try to connect it with the latest words. So some kind of time series because most of the other methods, uh, they have a problem. Like for example, I have given two sentences here. I like to eat chocolates. So like and chocolate has some connection here, but in sentence two, like and chocolates are separated by a big distance. And many of the other methods uh, fail whenever two words which are supposed to be related are separated uh, by a big distance. And LSTM basically solves that problem. Another thing that we come across is these medical speeches or transcriptions may not be equal in length. There may be some which are only like 50 words, but there are some which are 2,500 words long. So that's another thing that we tackle when we work with NLP. We have this concept of padding or truncation. We do the padding if we fix a number as 1,500 and we have only 500, then the other 1,000 words will just add zeros. So that's called padding. And if we are targeting 1,500, but we have 2,500, then we truncate. So we cut either at the beginning or towards the end. So that also we can control and bring it to 1,500. So before we can apply LSTM, we make sure that everything is exactly equal in length. So this was the outcome where there are uh, 50 different symptoms and you will see that the algorithm is not able to classify everything with high accuracy. So you have one case like symptom number 15, which has very close to 100% accuracy. But then if you look at 49th symptom, that's like uh, almost 10%. So there's a huge uh, variety. And uh, obviously this may not be the best model, but it needs to be improved. This is a popular CRISP model, cross industry standard process for data mining. And in fact, in industries, when people apply these methods, they go through these uh, six steps. I'll not spend too much time on this, but I think one has to be familiar with these methods, uh, especially like if you are applying this method, one should know the process. In fact, the case studies that I showed, I try to put them under these headings for completeness. 
when we studied all these methods, when we are looking for jobs, what people are looking for are basically somebody with experience in three major areas. If you are working with an artificial intelligence area and learning machine learning and deep learning methods, you must have a very solid understanding of basic statistics. That's still important. So although we do a lot of machine learning, but we also do a lot of uh, statistical tests. I'm sure you have heard words like uh, analytics and analysis. So in data science, remember that machines do analytics and humans do analysis. So machines do analytics, but obviously under our guidance, so far they are still AI, uh, where AI is mostly narrow AI. And it can do one specific thing. Like if you ask question to Siri, it can reply to you. But if you ask for a coffee, it's not going to serve you a coffee. So it's not a general AI. It's not AGI, which is artificial general intelligence. But people obviously have dreams of going towards AGI. But whatever skill set you're developing, statistics should be part of that. Hacking skills is mostly ability to do some coding. I do most of my coding in R and R Studio. So that's my hacking skills. And subject expertise, if you are working in healthcare, so obviously when you spend a lot of time, many years, so that expertise will come to you. Once you combine all these three into one, that's what makes somebody uh, very strong. For machine learning, I have created this playlist of top 10 must know machine learning methods. So if you are in this field or if you are doing PhD or if you are looking for jobs, this list could be very useful to you. So make sure that you understand the basics and you are able to run these algorithms in a certain way. Out of three major things that somebody needs to be successful in life, I think reading is a one of the most important things and I treat reading as like number one. I read a saying somewhere that people who don't read are no better than those who can't. Two books that I have listed here, one is AI superpowers. So how China is beating the world, actually China is uh, well ahead of uh, many other countries when it comes to artificial intelligence. And uh, this book actually provides a lot of interesting uh, cases and uh, examples that you may find interesting. So this is like a regular reading book. You can read very easily, not very heavy duty, but just a light reading. But if you are looking to develop some skills in deep learning, you can make use of advanced deep learning with R, which basically each chapter is an example where you start with the data and the end result is like how you arrive at your conclusions. And for jobs, I just Google healthcare. You can combine it with data or analytics. And in US, I see like a lot of entry level jobs. And Massachusetts, in terms of like providing jobs, the number one field is healthcare. The maximum number of people are employed in healthcare related jobs in Massachusetts. And in future, it is likely to grow because people are living longer and that will create more and more, more interesting and new needs. And many of these jobs that I see healthcare data analysts, for example, they require you to know some algorithms like R, R Studio or Python. Uh, Python I have seen is mostly used by people who work in computer related fields. And R is mostly used by people in business.